Well, welcome to um, a different way of approaching Holden Interfaith Week. I'm honored to be able to present to you a Judaism one-on-one, -on -one, which I've done in person for the past few years, but um, have an opportunity now to put it down and um, record it for posterity and um, for you to um, be able to um, enjoy from the comfort of your own home this summer. And so this year I decided to address Judaism past, present, and future, because too often I spend most of my time on the past, and I wanted to make sure this year that we also addressed present day Judaism and also some thoughts about the future. So we're gonna begin with a very, very ancient past, um, going back thousands of years before the Common Era. And this is one of the um, primary notes in discussing Jewish history that I need to lead with, which is that instead of saying AD, after the death, or BC, before Christ, um, in the Jewish context, we often use BCE, before the Common Era, so before the year zero, and um, after the Common Era. Um, so we're going to be starting today with 1800 before the Common Era, so around, we don't know really how long ago it was, but thousands of years before the year zero. In mythic history, because we don't have any secondary evidence for this, all we have is the story in the Torah, we have um, the story of Abraham and Sarah being, in our tradition, the first Jews, the first people to um, follow this God. In the Torah, we learn that Abraham, from within the depths of his soul, hears a voice that calls him to leave his father's home in Haran, to leave his father's home, which would have been in around Turkey, and to travel to Canaan, to travel to this promised land where God promises him and Sarah that he will make them a great nation that their descendants will be as numerous as the stars, and that their descendants will also be a blessing to the whole world. And so the Jewish story really begins with the story of the patriarch and matriarch Abraham and Sarah journeying towards the promised land, childless, no real evidence that they're going to become this great nation and this great blessing other than their deep, deep, instinct, God calling, however you want to phrase it. And so Abraham and Sarah traveled down to Canaan, and from there we learn the story in the book of Genesis of the patriarchs and matriarchs. Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, and Isaac marries Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah give birth to Jacob and Esau, and Jacob after sealing Esau's birthright, then becomes the progenitor of the 12 tribes. He marries Leah and Rachel, also has two handmaidens, and they um, give birth to collectively these 12 men who represent the 12 tribes, which are gonna be the 12 tribes of Israel. At the end of the book of Genesis, we learn that those 12 tribes go down to Egypt to um, find a better life, to move away from from starvation, from drought, and they settle there for um, hundreds of years. And the book of Exodus picks back up with the words, these words that a new Pharaoh rose up over Israel, a Pharaoh that they did not know. So by this point, the Israelites, those 12 tribes have developed into tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who live in Egypt. And this new pharaoh enslaves them and tortures them and makes their lives so despicable that they cry out and that this cry is heard by God, is heard by the divine, who seems to have been out of contact with people in the Israelite faith, or at least not on a grand national scale, as we see um, in the family stories of the book of Genesis. But suddenly voice, God's voice comes back. And God selects Moses, who we learn in the book of Exodus, was originally an Israelite baby boy who was saved by his mother and the midwives from Pharaoh's decree that all Jewish baby boys shall be killed. Moses is sent in down the Nile. His name in Egyptian means drawn from the water. Pharaoh's daughter finds him 
brings him into the household where he is raised as part of Pharaoh's household. And one day he goes out into the cities and he sees in the streets that there's a taskmaster beating an Israelite slave and something within him, a voice within him, just like with Abraham, a voice within him comes out, but this time it comes out in this form of righteous indignation and rage and Moses kills the taskmaster and Moses has to run into the desert to run away from the consequences of his actions. And when he's in the desert, he comes to a little burning bush, something that most people wouldn't even notice, but he watches it. And he sees that this little bush is burning up, but it's really not burning up. It's just, it's just this fire that keeps going. And the voice comes from the bush and says to Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. I have a special message for you. You're going to go and you're going to liberate these Israelites. They're your people. You're their voice. And so Moses goes back to Egypt and becomes the liberator along with Moses, with uh, Miriam and Aaron, becomes the liberator of the Israelite people. It says that it was a mixed multitude of slaves who left, not just Israelite slaves, but they took all the other slaves with them. And so Moses according to this timeline, around 1250 before the Common Era, we don't really know when it happened or if it happened, but according to our mythic history, it's a hodgepodge of myth and history, Moses leads the Hebrews out of Egyptian bondage towards the Promised Land. And in our story, once they leave the Promised Land, they find their way to Sinai where they receive the Ten Commandments. And according to Jewish tradition, also all of the Torah, including the 613 mitzvot, the 613 commandments um, for how to live a righteous life, a righteous Jewish life. And so the Israelites wander for 40 years in the desert. Part of the lesson of the Torah is that those who left Egypt, it turns out were not fit for freedom. They weren't fit for the promised land. And so they had to wander in circles for 40 years until every single person who left Egypt died out and it was only their children who were allowed into the promised land and they went into the promised land all 12 tribes divided up the territory and they established an autonomous um, society based on the ten commandments based on the torah based on the story of the israelite people and throughout jewish history in that time there's been a lot of struggle we went from not having kings to having kings. So we see that around 1000 before the Common Era, we have King David um, and then King Solomon who built the temple in Jerusalem. One important thing to note is that we were never a temple-based tradition from biblical times. In the Torah, we're told to build a traveling sanctuary, a mishkan, that can be taken up and down, a portable sanctuary that housed the Ten Commandments, According to tradition, it also housed the broken set of the Ten Commandments, which we also carried with us. Um, but once we got into the Promised Land, a lot of society building starting to happen. And the Israelites, they wanted what all the people around them, all the other foreign nations around them wanted. They wanted a king. They wanted a temple. And so that's what happened. So we have King David, King Solomon, the temple, the great temple um, built in Jerusalem. That would be the first temple which was destroyed in 586. We also see that um, in 722 before the Common Era, the Assyrians des destroyed the Northern Kingdom of Israel and dispersed the 10 tribes. And this is a question I often get is, well, what happened to all these tribes? Well, part of our history is that because of conquest, because of the location of where Israel is, there's people coming in from east, from west, from north, from south, and Israel happened to be a location of many, many conquests, dispersals, disruption of the population. And so we see that around 722, when the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom, because it divided up into two kingdoms at a certain point, um, 10 of the tribes were assimilated into the larger population. Um, some think that this was on purpose to help just to aid in the destruction of the Israelites by forcing their tribal identity to be assimilated into the general identity of the peoples living in that area. In 586, 
the first temple is destroyed and the elite of Judea, the, e the elite of those of the southern kingdom are actually removed and taken to Babylonia. The people, what in Hebrew we call them the Ameha Aretz, the people of the land, the workers, not the elites, they stayed. And they were the ones actually who sort of assimilated into just one tribe, which was the tribe of Israel. All tribal status was pretty much erased during this time period. The Israelites were exiled, they were in Babylonia. While they were in Babylonia and Egypt and other places, some mini little temples were actually built. They tried to carry the temple structure with them um, elsewhere and continue temple practice with the priests outside of the land of Israel. It didn't work. It didn't work. Those temples didn't stick. They were brought back and in 428, um, the second temple was dedicated by Ezra and Nehemiah. And so the, the population was brought back to Israel and a second temple was built. Um, and Ezra and Nehemiah, we might know from the Bible, they were the ones who really started to build Judaism as we know it, as opposed to the Israelite religion. Judaism as we know it, because when they came back from Babylonia, one of the things that Ezra and Nehemiah instituted was public Torah reading. So the scroll that we keep in our synagogues, the Torah scroll, has the five books of Moses written on it, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They are written on it um, using a special ink. The Torah scroll itself is animal parchment. And um, we still to this day read it as a scroll as they did back um, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. And one of the things Ezra and Nehemiah said is each week we're going to read this publicly for the people. And that's going to be at the core of our tradition is public reading of this scroll week by week by week. Ezra and Nehemiah actually indicate that they want the scroll read in the vernacular that people can understand. Today we read the Torah scroll in Hebrew aloud, but we also always have a translation because there's no point in reading it aloud if people can't understand the words. And so public Torah reading became core. One of the things that Ezra and Nehemiah also in, um, instituted was a prohibition on intermarriage. By this point, the Israelites were just one big tribe with a priestly caste, and they started to develop rules around protecting their tribal status as one tribe. And we can also see that that became part of um, what became Judaism, is keeping marriage within the group. Now today, in American Judaism, over 50% of American Jews intermarry. But for much of Jewish history, leading up to um, Jews' emancipation um, in the French Revolution, being able to be citizens of the countries that they live in, which happened after the French Revolution, between this time and the French Revolution, Jews almost exclusively intermarried. Um, and that is one way, truly, that we were able to keep um, our tradition and stay alive as a people. In 164 before the Common Era, we have the Hasmovian revolt against the Greeks. So we know that by 164, the Greeks were now in charge of the area we call Israel. Again, we have all these different conquests, very little of the Jews' time, of Israelites' time in the land of Egypt. I mean, excuse me, in the land of, of Israel, was autonomous. For most of the time, we were under the rule of other people. And so the, under the rule of the Greeks, um, we revolted because they took over the temple in Jerusalem, according to the stories in the books of Maccabees, and that there was a small group of priests who were also fighters. So these were fighter priests who took up weapons. And they had a seven-year war against the Greeks to recapture the temple in Jerusalem. And the story of Hanukkah, the reason why we celebrate Hanukkah, um, is because of this recapture. The story of Hanukkah is that when these fighter priests were able to finally defeat the Greeks and recapture the temple, they wanted to reinstitute the practice, the priestly practice. They wanted to do their job, stop fighting and start praying and start offering sacrifices to God and gratitude to God. And so they wanted to rededicate the temple in honor of the divine. Hanukkah means de dedication. And um, they also wanted to celebrate 
the Feast of Booths that had happened back in the fall, which is a seven day holiday. They hadn't been able to celebrate it because they hadn't have control of the temple. And so they celebrated this week long holiday as a rededication of the temple. This is the story we hear often about there not being enough light, excuse me, oil to light the Ner Tamid, the eternal light that always was ever, was ever present in the temple. But this little, little amount that they found somehow lasted for a week, and that's the great miracle of Hanukkah. But truly, the great miracle of Hanukkah is not the oil. It's the survival of the people. It's these priests who fought back to be able to practice their religion and maintain autonomy, at least in the temple, if nowhere else in the land. Now, Greek influence on Jewish civilization was not all negative. And so much about the intellectualism of Judaism, its um, book focus, its study focus, its philosophy focus, really comes from the Greeks and from their influence on our civilization. So every time there was a conquest, every time a group came and took over the area that the Israelites saw as being their homeland, there was both a curse, but often there was also a small blessing, and sometimes, in the case of the Greeks, a huge blessing because we owe a lot of our intellectual development um, to them. What we know about world history is the Greeks were followed by the Romans, and the Romans were, again, rulers in the land of Israel. Um, as Christians, um, people are often very, very uh, familiar with Second Temple times and the rule of the Romans and their relationship to the temple, their relationship to Israelites, and of course Jesus came into this world from that context, what we call the Second Temple period. And we also know that that was a very problematic period, a lot of divisiveness, a lot of sectarianism. And what emerges from the Second Temple period and the temple being destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 of the Common Era, we're on the other side of zero now, the year 70 of the Common Era, what emerged was Christianity and Judaism. So from Second Temple time, when the temple was destroyed, that population and that way of thinking and that heritage actually sprouted off into two branches. Judaism, which then became led by the rabbis, and Christianity, which was inspired by Jesus' followers. And so now we have these two branches. No temple, which was really problematic for Jews, for the Israelites, those in that heritage, because they were focused completely in their worship and their rituals and their holidays and their leadership around temple service. There were priests. They were in charge of the temple. How did you pray to God? You brought offerings to the temple. How did you ask for forgiveness? You brought offerings to the temple. And so what do you do when the complete center of your tradition is taken down to the ground, destroyed? There's a story of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai standing on the rubble, the still burning rubble of the second temple. And his students come to him and they say, what are we going to do now? How do we practice our tradition? And Yochanan ben Zakkai helps our tradition pivot to a new reality. Instead of sacrificing animals, priestly service, um, anything that happened in the temple, we now pivot, and he tells them, our world now stands on three things. Study of Torah, the five books of Moses, and our other canonical texts. We study it, we learn it, we make it our life and the length of our days. This text is at our center. Torah, avodah. Avodah means work. It was also the, what we called what the priests did in the temple. Um, we turn that into prayer. So instead of offering three sacrifices at the temple every day, we evolved into Jews praying three times a day. There was the morning sacrifice that became morning prayer. There was the afternoon sacrifice that became afternoon prayer. And there was the evening sacrifice and that became evening prayer. How do we repent? Through prayer. How do we offer gratitude? through prayer. So Torah, study of Torah, avodah, prayer. And last but surely not least, 
The last thing he said was gimme lut chasadim, which means acts of love and kindness, which means we will continue to be a blessing to this world through bringing goodness and love into this world through our daily actions. And so Judaism at that point was birthed just the same way that Christianity was birthed through Jesus teachings. Judaism, as we understand it today, was birthed through the destruction of the second temple and through associating our tradition now, not with priests and animal sacrifices and temples, but with studying our sacred text, praying our prayers three times a day, and bringing goodness and love and righteousness into this world through our acts, through our time here on this planet. Judaism also sought to understand how can we take this book, the five books of Moses, the Torah, and how can we make it ever present in our lives? And that required um, re-understanding how to be Jewish without the land of Israel, because we were exiled, without the priests, without the temple. In the year 200 of the Common Era, the Mishnah was codified, and this was the first major religious text that came out of the destruction of the Second Temple. In the Mishnah, some major, major things change within Judaism. Number one, we change from a patrilineal society to a matrilineal society. In the Torah, you inherit your ancestry, you inherit your status from your father. But now in the Mishnah, it changes. There's a radical transformation and in, in the Mishnah changes to the mother. How do you know if you're Jewish? If your mother is Jewish. Why? Why make that change? That change happened because we lost our, the land. We lost our, our body, our spiritual body, which was the land of Israel. And the closest thing that you can come to land when you are in exile is your mother's body. You know you come from there. The Mishnah also clarified how Jews now will eat, pray, travel. Almost every aspect of life is addressed in the Mishnah, and it's the beginning of understanding how to practice this tradition and be part of this people outside the land of Israel, outside the promised land. Part of what also happens during this time period in the first couple thousand years of the Common Era um, is that our bodies, Jewish bodies, were at risk. I would say especially in the first 1800 years after the year zero, um, much of what's displayed on this page, our bodies were at risk because of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, what birthed out of the destruction of the Second Temple and the separation of Judaism and Christianity into two branches was also an inherent tension and conflict. And as Christianity became the normative tradition of the West, Jews and oppression of the Jews also became an implicit norm. And so we were not free for many, many, many hundreds of years to travel, to own property, to do a lot of different things that the Christian population was allowed to do. And so for much of this time, we went inwards and we studied and we debated and we played with our tradition and our text. And the Talmud, um, which was codified around the year 500 of the Common Era, is actually a dynamic commentary on the Mishnah. So if you imagine a page, a blank page, right in the middle of that page will be a few lines from the Mishnah, which is a long book, but not as long as the Talmud. Around those few lines that are in the center of the page is lots and lots of little blocks of commentary from people um, all over the world, different approaches to commentary. And it's basically, com Talmud is commentary on the Mishnah. There's volumes and volumes and volumes of it. And one thing that always surprises people about the Talmud is that it's not a law code. It's just a conversation. It is a record of conversations. It's very much like the internet because it hyperlinks to different concepts and ideas. And it's a very, very sophisticated, dynamic conversation where people debate, but there's very few end of conversations. There's very few decisions. It's mostly conversation and debate, um, thousands of pages of it. And that's where 
Judaism's intellectual history really begins to develop with an emphasis on philosophy and law and ethics. But the Talmud also includes things like medicine, for example, describes in the Talmud how to perform an abortion. Because in Judaism, based on the interpretations of the Torah, if a woman's life is at risk because of a pregnancy, you are required to perform an abortion. So much so that in the Talmud, it describes how to do it. Because a, a person's life, and this is part of what emerges in post-biblical Judaism, saving a life or preserving a life is considered to be the ultimate commandment. And fetuses, until they can breathe on their own within the Jewish context, are not considered to be a whole life. They're considered to be a potential life, appendage of the mother, but the mother's life always takes precedence over the fetus. And that is such a strong ethic that we have the, the medical framework for how to actually perform this operation to save her life. The Talmud is filled of stories. Some of them are fantastical. For example, there's a story that says that when Pharaoh's daughter reached out to get Moses from the River Nile, there's an interpretation that the word for reaching out or stretching her arm, the interpretation is that her arm actually stretched out, sort of like stretchy man, like a superhero. Her arm stretched in this amazing, fantastical way to draw him in. So the Talmud is a lot of things. You can't categorize it as any one type of literature. It is fascinating, it is frustrating, um, and it is a lifelong engagement. Um, today, Jews read it in a seven-year cycle, studying one page a day, and it takes seven years to get through the whole thing. We just began a new seven-year cycle of studying it in um, January of 2020. Study of Talmud became the core of practice, study of Torah, study of Talmud, um, and also in the medieval times, around the time of the expulsion from Spain, we also find that we do have a need for law codes so that people went through the Mishnah and the Talmud and then debated some more and figured out, okay, how do we actually practice this tradition? We can talk about it forever. We clearly were able to discuss it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but we do need codes to figure out, how do you keep kosher? How do you keep the Sabbath? And so we did develop law codes, which became the core of Orthodox Judaism. And to this day, Orthodox Jews do still live by those law codes. Jews settled over the first 1500 years of the Common Era throughout North Africa, India, China, Ethiopia, went to the Americas, spread all, all over the world. Um, and a lot of the spreading out had to do with having to move because of anti-Semitism. So in the year 1100, we were expelled from England and then we were expelled from Spain. And Jews were often expelled from different countries in Europe um, and were constantly moving around. But we also know that in 1492, Jews had settled in Spain and Portugal leading up to 1492 because it was more liberal and they were le leaving some more conservative parts of Europe. But in 1492, a new pharaoh or a new leader arose who did not know the Jews, and they were expelled from Spain and Portugal. They had um, just a couple of choices. They could leave, they could convert to Christianity, or they could be killed. And I, on my honeymoon, we went to Spain and Morocco, and we were in Toledo by a church, and in my guidebook, it said that this was in front of this church is where Jews were burned alive at the stake. And it was the only time in my life where I ever woke up screaming in the middle of the night because you could feel what had happened there. You could feel that hundreds and hundreds of people were burned at the stake because they were not willing to convert to Catholicism. And so when Jews left, Spain and Portugal, where did they go? They went to North Africa. They also went to what we understand today to be Poland, because at that time period, Poland was the really liberal, welcoming, open place. And so Jews from all over Europe started to settle in Poland, and that became what we, un we end up understanding later in history as the Pale of Settlement. 
um, an area of Poland, Russia, Ukraine that became um, a center for Jewish life and a thriving place for Jewish life in Europe. But once again, the tides of history change. And so while Jews were living in Europe and um, thriving there, um, anti-Semitism, of course, re reared its ugly head once again. And by the 1800s, the late 1800s, um, Jews started to immigrate en masse to the United States of America, seeking a place of religious liberty, seeking a place where they could live in safety, seeking a place where they'd be protected um, by the Constitution. And so we do see hundreds of thousands of Jews, first from Germany, then from Eastern Europe around 1900, immigrating to the United States. Um, many did stay in Europe. Um, we know that because six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. So many stayed in Europe, but we knew and we understood um, starting in the 1800s, um, early 1900s, that Europe was going to be a problematic place for Jews to live, even though we'd lived there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And we go from a time where most of the world Jewish population was in Europe to very, very little of the world population being in Europe. So in 1938, Kristallnacht, that's a night of breaking of the glass when there were raids of Jewish businesses um, and the windows of Jewish businesses were broken, igniting the beginning of the Holocaust, um, a period of mass extermination and genocide, um, which then led into the creation of the State of Israel. And so let me just pause here and talk about Israel for a moment. You remember at the beginning of this talk, we talked about exile, about leaving, about being forced out. The whole trajectory of the Torah is for us to get to the promised land. And we get there, but we don't stay there. We are kicked out first with the first exile to Babylonia. We're kicked out again when the second temple is destroyed by the Romans and exiled all over the world. But throughout it all, including 100 of the common era, 200 throughout the Talmud, all of our texts, all of our prayers, all of our holidays, Israel's at the core the land of Israel. So in Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, we eat pomegranates and apples and honey, not because those things grow in many of the places where Jews were living, especially pomegranates, but because those were symbolic foods for the land of Israel for the fall holiday. We celebrate Tu Bishvat, which is the New Year of the trees in February, when the first trees in Israel start to bloom for the spring, which are the almond trees. And we celebrate that holiday in places where no almond trees exist. So Israel has always been at the center of our prayers, of our holidays, of our religious life. And even when Jews for hundreds and hundreds of years had no pictures of it, no memory of it, it was what they held out for as the promised land. That's what they were living for, is someday we're going to make it back there. And it became to represent not just a place of God's blessing, but a place of security, a place where we can live without being constantly attacked and murdered and raped and not having to move around all the time, a place where we can really put our roots in. And so in 1948, after the Holocaust, the world community, including the United States, came together to create a homeland for the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland and also in their spiritual homeland. And we know that this is very problematic because there were already people living there, Palestinians, Druze, and Berbers. And the creation of a modern nation state within the context of a land where other people had been living was problematic. Having said that, before the state of Israel, it wasn't as though it was an independent Palestinian Druze or Berber homeland, that that land had been under domination of various groups um, over several thousand years. And so when Israel was formed by the United Nations, Jews, masses of Jews, of refugees, every single one except for a few hundred families who had lived consistently in the land of Israel, um, came in to form Israel as um, a place of safety and security for the Jewish people. So we're in 2020, Israel was formed in 1948, it has not been that long. And we know that to this day, Jews are still seeking a place 
to live in security and freedom. Israel, since 1948, has been attacked consistently. So we can't really even say that Israel is a place of security and freedom. And of course, we know that anti-Semitism has ebbed and flowed, um, but it's definitely flowing today all over the world. And so we still live with persistent anti-Semitism, but we also still live with this profoundly dynamic, evolving tradition. And I define Judaism not as a religion. There are people who are Jews, active, engaged, synagogue-going Jews who do not believe in God. You don't have to believe in God to be Jewish. Judaism is so much bigger, and I know that's hard to understand, but it is so much bigger than the word God. God represents something that within the Jewish tradition is unfathomable and also um, a name that we cannot declare. In our tradition, God's proper name is not pronounceable by human beings. So we're always grasping and reaching to understand God, but we, none of us, no human being can say God's name. And that's really important to the tradition because it allows us to evolve and change. And that is what Judaism has done over the course of 2000 years, as we have evolved and changed, um, often not just to be survivors. We don't evolve and change just to survive, we evolve and change in order to bring blessing to this world. And so in 1972, the year I was born, the first female wo woman rabbi was ordained. Since that time, Judaism, liberal Judaism, progressive Judaism, which is the largest denomination um, in the world, and we'll look at some graphs in a few minutes, has evolved and changed in a lot of really different important ways. Women have been ordained since 1972, but LGBTQ people have been ordained in some of the denominations since um, the 1980s. Also, LGBTQ marriages have also been officiated for um, several decades. And we also officiate liberal Judaism um, and intermarriages and create families without requiring um, one of the partners to actually convert to Judaism. So there's a lot of different ways that we've evolved from um, our ancient biblical times. Another way we've evolved in being egalitarian, which is some, one of the values we picked up over our um, course of human history um, as Jews, egalitarianism, is that we now, within the denominations of Judaism, the liberal denominations, accept someone as Jewish if their mother or father is Jewish, their mother or father. So we embrace both the biblical standard of Judaism being inherited by the father and the post-biblical standard of Judaism being inherited by the mother. And of course, um, starting in the Roman period, people could also be converted to Judaism and go through a process of converting to Judaism, which essentially um, is a process of being adopted by the family. And so when someone converts to Judaism, it involves studying and learning about Judaism, um, usually living with the community um, for about a year and practicing with the community. It involves taking on a Hebrew name, you get to choose a new name. Um, and most importantly, with that new name, you also become the child of Abraham and Sarah. So anyone who converts to Judaism, their lineage, they're given Abraham and Sarah as their adoptive parents, taking them right back to the very beginning of this conversation, which was the advent of the Jewish journey with the journey of Abraham and Sarah, leaving the land of their ancestors and becoming the new parents of a new ancestry, um, which became the Jewish people. So let's talk about the present. We've learned about the past, but let's talk about the present. Let's look at where Jews live. So you can see the little blue dot is Israel, um, very, very teeny little land. We have about 6 million Jewish people living there. But if you look all over the world, the other large populations are Canada and the United States, and to a lesser extent, um, Central and South America, to a lesser extent, also Russia, Australia and South Africa also have Jewish populations. And what you'll notice is that those places were places that were um, especially South Africa, Australia, 
Central and South America were places that Jews went to escape the Holocaust. Um, and so they were places that welcomed in Jews often when um, they were refugees from European countries where they lost their citizenship. It's also true of the United States. So Israel and the United States have the two largest Jewish populations in the world. Both are democracies and democracies seem to do very, very well. You'll notice that in a lot of places in the world that are not democracies, they're places that Jews don't live. Um, so we, we've chosen to live in places where we can have representation, where we can have religious liberty, um, freedom of movement, freedom of gathering, many of the things that the Constitution provides us as um, protections under the law. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Jewish denominationalism. Because often it's Orthodox Jews, the, the Jews that live according to the medieval law codes of um, how to practice Judaism, they're the most visible. They're the most um, identifiable on the externals as Jews. So when you think of a Jew, you might be thinking of a Hasidic Jew with a black hat and a black coat and side curls and the women wearing wigs. Um, and that is a manifestation of Judaism that came out of Eastern Europe from the Pale of Settlement time period. And Orthodox Jews seek to live a Judaism that is consistent, consistent with that time period of Europe of the 15, 16, 17, 1800s. So they're, the clothes that they're wearing, they're not necessarily distinctive Jewish clothing. They're the way people dressed back hundreds of years ago in Europe. And the way that they practice Judaism is not necessarily the most authentic way of practicing Judaism. I'd say there isn't any one authentic way. Um, but it's actually the way that Judaism was practiced several hundred years ago by some groups. And so the Orthodox sort of, sort of put Judaism in a freezer and tried to maintain it from one period of Jewish history, while some of the other denominations, Reform, Conservative, Reform being the largest, conservative the second largest, and then you'll see there's other smaller liberal Jewish groups, Reconstructionist, Progressive, Jewish Renewal. Reform, conservative, Reconstructionist, Progressive, and Renewal are all considered to be the liberal denominations of Judaism. Conservative being the least liberal and most wanting to sort of be on the fence between Orthodox and what we would say is modernity po or postmodern Judaism. Um, and these, these denominations, which make up the vast majority of Jewish life on this planet, have embraced, in addition to inheriting the Torah, the Talmud, and all the Jewish wisdom, these denominations also embrace the liberties and the um, profound intellectual concepts that came out of the French Revolution of egalitarianism, pluralism, democracy. And so, Reform conservative and the other smaller denominations like Reconstructionists, where I was ordained, um, all try to bring together these ideas of pluralism, egalitarianism, and democracy into this very ancient tradition of Judaism. And what you will see in American Jewish life today is the result of that. So in our congregation, Congregation Kolami, or we have actually changed our name recently to Kolami, a center for Jewish life, you will find that we're actually 70% interfaith families, which means that 70% of the families in our congregation, one person in the relationship's Jewish and one is not. But they've chosen to raise their children as Jews or they've chosen to find their spiritual home as a family, their ethnic home as a family, their cultural home as a family within the Jewish community. In our congregation too, women and LGBTQ people have full inclusion we actually consider our congregation to be post-patriarchal, which means that we have been able to eradicate patriarchy from our practice of Judaism. And it doesn't look that different than all the other forms of Judaism. We still celebrate the Sabbath. We still read the same Torah portion. We still pray the same prayers. We've just removed the genderedness from it. So we've disgendered or ungendered Judaism for the future. A Judaism that where all people, regardless of, of sexual orientation, status, um, gender is just not, does not need to be um, a concept that is alive and present within Judaism. So instead of saying bar or bat mitzvah, which is bars for a boy, bat is for a girl, many congregations are just saying be mitzvah, 
because we don't want to make any assumptions about male, female. We just want to welcome and grow and nurture Jews. And the gender part does not seem to be essential to Judaism, which I personally find to be amazing that we've been able to take this tradition and maintain so much continuity and at the same time extricate something as foundational and fundamental as gender. And it works and it's beautiful and it's thriving. Some of the other major differences of, uh, between the denominations are approach to keeping kosher. So in reform and conservative and the other liberal denominations, people may or may not keep the laws of kashrut, the dietary laws. More often than not, you're going to find that Jews simply just don't eat pork. And pork, why don't Jews eat pork? Pork, um, according to the, the laws of what animals are permissible and not permissible in the book of Leviticus, pork is actually not named. But what we are told is you are only allowed to eat mammals that chew their cud and have split hooves. And pork, they, or, or pigs actually, they don't have split hooves and they don't chew their cud. And so while pork products and pigs and, and growing pigs um, pig farming might have been very popular in Europe. Jews became specifically identified with not eating pork for the simple fact that pigs don't have split hooves or chew their cud. When can you eat pork? In the case of saving a life. But other than that, pork and many other animals are off the table according to Jewish dietary laws and many Jews just maintain not eating pork as part of their identity as a Jew, even if they eat meat that's not kosher or mix milk, meat and dairy together, which are some of the other laws um, pertaining to diet. Also, the laws of family purity are um, observed differently between Orthodox and liberal Judaism. Within Orthodox Judaism, women, when they menstruate, um, need to maintain a distance from their husband and their, their, the men in their lives. They're not supposed to touch anything that a man touches while they're menstruating. And in order to be able to sleep in the same bed or to reintegrate themselves into the family, they need to um, go to the mikveh, to the ritual bath, to cleanse themselves. Liberal Jews, by and large, tend not to follow the laws of, lamp, of family purity, although maybe before a transition like a wedding or, or a divorce, we might use the ritual bath as a tool for transitioning identity. God, Torah, and Israel. So this is sort of the core of Judaism today. There's a focus on God, although again, you don't have to be a believer in God, but we still have a focus and a connection to divinity. And Judaism, um, we have 72 different names for God. So God is more than anything like a prism um, that we refract reality through and see in many, many different ways. Torah, Torah refers not just to the five books of Moses, but all Jewish wisdom and all um, the light that's been passed down from the generations to us. And then Israel, both the philosophical fantasy myth of Israel that we carried with us, not even knowing what it looked like for hundreds of years, and Israel today as being our homeland and the center of our culture and our identity as a world Jewish population. Because Jews come in all colors. One of the things that's so beautiful about Judaism is because we were in exile for so long, we did intermarry with the populations wherever we lived. And Jews um, look like people all over the world. So it's hard to identify and say Judaism is an ethnicity or a race. It's, we, it's hard to define what Judaism is. It's not a religion. It's not a race, it's not one ethnicity. I would say that what we are is um, a very a diverse ancient tribe of people who have lived all over the world, but are connected in some very, very profound ways. And I wanna leave you today with just um, six pieces of wisdom from the tradition. This is what we've evolved into. Um, theologically, ethically, culturally over the last many thousand years. First is that within um, Judaism, we see ourselves as a, made in the image of God. That humanity and Jews and Jews practicing Judaism, we are mirroring divinity. We are here on this planet to make God manifest through our actions and our good deeds. 
Um, the second is Shema, that Judaism has a focus on monotheism, and by monotheism, we don't mean necessarily that there's just one God, but rather that God is everything, that there's just oneness, that everything on this planet, everything in creation is interconnected, and we are part of one whole. Number three, that principles of the universe are discoverable. You know, Albert Einstein was one of the great spiritual teachers of the Jewish people when he said that God is the mystery at the heart of reality. And we seek as human beings with these crazy monkey brains to understand the universe. And that is what Einstein did is he sought that mystery at the heart of reality. And because of his seeking, which came truly from his soul, we have things like GPS and cell phones and all these amazing ways that we connect with each other all over the world. Number four, that man, or really humans, um, are in partnership with God, that we um, work hand in hand at being co-creators of divine reality with God. And part of our story, we have a prequel to the creation story in the Torah in Genesis. There's actually a prequel that came out of the Jewish mystics in the Middle Ages, and they said that before God created everything, all there was in this universe was godliness and no matter. There was nothing to hold on to, but God was lonely and God wanted to create something other than God's self. And so God tried to create matter by creating a hole in the universe and then pouring divine godliness into that hole, which was really a vessel, but divine godliness was too powerful and there was this huge explosion. And in that explosion, the universe as we know it became, was created, which sounds like they intuited the Big Bang. And our work is to actually try to find all those shards of pure divine um, holiness that are embedded in the universe and bring them all together. That's the work of tikkun olam, of healing and repairing our world, is finding the sparks. And number five is that matter matters, that that matter, that creation that came out of that explosion, whether you believe it spiritually, scientifically, however you believe it, that matter is imbued with holiness, and this planet matters, human beings matter, and Judaism evolved, has evolved to be a distinctly and profoundly this-worldly religion, which means you will never hear me give a sermon about the world to come unless I'm speaking about it within the context of um, a folk tale. But we, we focus on this world all the time. Um, what happens after we die, we just decided we don't know, we have examples within the Jewish tradition of everything from resurrection of the dead to reincarnation to joining with the collective soul of your family. So there's many different ways of understanding the afterlife within the Jewish tradition. But the most important thing to know is it's just really not a big issue for us. We just don't talk about it because matter is what matters. And then number six, and I think this evolved from our time um, becoming a big brain when our bodies were so weak in Europe, is that there's a great theological skepticism, meaning that there's a lot of theology in Judaism, but there isn't any one theology. You don't have to believe one thing. As I said before, you don't even have to believe in God in order to be Jewish and practice Judaism. So there's this, and I would just say skepticism is part of Judaism, is asking questions. And I, I, you know, Judaism is not a religion of answers. If you're going to identify it as a religion in any way, the most important things to know is it's not about answers, it's about questions. It's a tradition where we help to form good questions that lead us forward into a healthy future. And by poking at our own tradition and asking why and asking if things can be different and does the world have to be this way, we move ourselves towards tikkun olam, towards the complete healing of our world, which some Jews will call the messianic era, that there will be a time when all of humanity and nature lie down with each other in peace. And that we're working towards that goal of wholeness and completion and beauty and goodness being the pervading movements in this world. And so we join with all other religious traditions and civilizations who seek a planet at peace, a humanity at peace, a place filled with justice and goodness and mercy and compassion, which goes all the way back to number one in, in the image of God, because we will chant um, on Yom Kippur, on the high holidays, God's divine characteristics, El Rachum V'chanun, 
a God who is compassionate and loving, Erech a God who is long-suffering, God who's full of truth. We chant those and then we take that into ourselves and we do the work the rest of the year to make that real in our world. And so I thank you for joining me in this Judaism, the past, the present, but the future, which is that we are here to walk hand in hand with the rest of humanity to make this world full of what God said at the beginning of the Torah, which is, and it was good, and it was tov. Thank you so much for joining me.